Okay, well, um, hello everybody. Um, thus far in our series on the idea of truth, we have explored philosophical accounts of truth, uh, the role of truth-seeking in science, <coughs> the quest for truth in religious belief and practice. Uh, we turn our attention today to the controversial issue of the relationship between truth and art, and I'm delighted to have joining me to discuss this two splendid practitioners of fiction writing and visual art, respectively. Uh, Dr. Helena Durai is Associate Professor of English here at USD. She was educated at UC Davis, interestingly earning her bachelor's degree in biological sciences before pursuing a master's in creative writing. And after that, MA, she studied at the University of Utah, where she received her PhD. Professor Durai's short stories have been published in The Sun, The Harvard Review, and many other journals and magazines. Her collection, The Family Canon, was published in 2014 and has been described in the Fiction Writers Review as, and I quote, tender and luminous. Professor Alison Weiss was educated first at Brown University and subsequently earned her MFA at UCSD. She is Associate Professor of Visual Arts in USD's Department of Art, Architecture, and Art History. Professor Weiss's work has been exhibited throughout the United States at such venues as Machine Project in LA, the Museum of Contemporary Art, San Diego, and Socrates Sculpture Park in New York. She is a recipient of the Lewis Comfort Tiffany Award and has also received grants from Art Matters, Creative Capital, and the Cultural Arts Council of Houston. Lovely to have you both with me today. Um, my role here today is to set out the contours of a particular and age-old criticism of art, namely that art is antithetical to truth. This is a position most famously articulated by Plato but it's also found in differing forms in the work of Jeremy Bentham and Sigmund Freud. I want to take a glance at each of these three today. Uh, the criticism of representational art that emerges from the pages of Plato's Republic is tied in very much with a metaphysics distinguishing this material world, shadowy, volatile, and distressingly changeable, distinguishing that from an immaterial world of ideal forms. Now, the problem with art, as Plato sees it, is that instead of directing our attention away from the material world to that perfect immaterial realm, the artist takes us entirely in the wrong direction, towards things that are even less real than the material objects of this fleeting world. As I said, Plato's criticism is connected with his very individual views of reality and the realm of the forms, but a more generalizable critique of art can be extracted from what he says. This concerns what might be called the illusory achievements of the artist. Uh, Plato, as always, through the mouth of Socrates, mockingly talks about a possible craftsman I quote, who can make all the objects produced by other particular crafts. The dialogue then proceeds like this. Um, so he's talked about this, this wonderful craftsman and his conversation partner says, he would be a wonderfully clever man. Just a minute, says Socrates, and you'll be more surprised still, for this same craftsman can not only make all artificial objects, but also create all plants and animals, himself included. An astonishing exhibition of skill. Well, there's a sense in which you could create them yourself. The quickest way is to take a mirror and turn it round in all directions. Before long, you will create sun and stars and earth, yourself and all other animals and plants, and furniture and the other objects we mention now. Yes, but they would be only reflections, not real things. Quite right, Socrates says, and, and very much to the point for a painter is a craftsman of just this kind, I think. Now these critical thoughts can be brought out in a number of ways. Here's one way you could do it. There's nothing particularly special or skillful in what an artist does, and nothing particularly admirable or useful. I can certainly admire 
a carpenter's work, a real carpenter's work. And I'm very grateful, in fact, for the carpenter's work, particularly for the carpenter's production of a sturdy, well-made bed. This is especially the case when I'm tired at the end of a long day or when my employer has destroyed me. <laughs> so I'm grateful for that, but why, conversely, should an artist have such a claim on my gratitude? Here, for example, um, is... Uh, oh, what's going on here? Here's a painting of a bed, a very famous painting of a bed, uh, by Van Gogh, inexplicably called Van Gogh, by... <laughs> you. Um, this, um, to use Socrates' words, is just a reflection of a bed. It's not a real thing, and it won't be of any use to me when I'm feeling tired or sleepy. Those inclined to this view may want to say that art, in this sense, is always somehow disappointing. Um, Roland Barthes makes this point. There's a great picture of Roland Barthes days when everyone used to smoke. <laughs> in Roland Barthes' version of this view, art can never quite give us what we want. Uh, our desire is for real objects in the real world, not just images of them. The example that Barthes is talking about here is that of erotica. One could probably also apply this thought to pornography, I suppose. Um, these things, he says, represent not so much the erotic scene as the expectation of it. It's ascent. That is what makes them exciting. And when the scene actually occurs, naturally there is disappointment, deflation. So the imagined lover, the lover in the photograph, say, pales in comparison to the real human lover. Another example of this, um, you can think of many, I suppose, but another example of this would be food. I, I, I like those restaurants a lot where they give you a laminated menu uh, displaying pictures of the food you can buy there. Um, Chili's, I think, is the greatest exponent of this, of this particular art. Now, the menu, of course, is not enough. I want you know, the mushroom Swiss burger and not the photograph of it. And the problem is that this is what art is. It's the menu and not the food. Disappointing. It doesn't give you what you really need. Now we can return for a moment to Plato's contrast between the carpenter and the artist. Um, this will take us back to the question of truth again. Carpenters will be concerned with issues of exactitude. It matters to the carpenter that the bed should not wobble. So the precise length and dimensions of the legs matter in this case. Not so the painter, or at least not to the same extent. It is this matter of exactitude and its close cousin truth, which is uppermost in Jeremy Bentham's criticism of the poetic arts. This is what the great founder of utilitarianism has to say. I remember when I was making this... Um, this PowerPoint that I've used this quotation before in a previous one, but you can never have too much Jeremy Bentham. It's one of those <laughs> universal truths of life, I suppose. This is Bentham's um, famously a, a hatred of, of poetry. Um, he says this, between poetry and truth, there is a natural opposition, false morals, fictitious nature. The poet always stands in need of something false. When he pretends to lay his foundations in truth, the ornaments of his superstructure are fictions. His business consists in stimulating our passions and exciting our prejudices. Truth, exactitude of every kind, is fatal to poetry. I, I hope you'll forgive me. I can never resist talking about Bentham and poetry without quoting that delicious line um, written in um, his letter to Lord Holland about the essential nature of poetry, what poetry means, and we're all together now. Bentham says, um, poetry is where some of the lines do not go as far as the margins, period. Now, back to the substance of uh, Bentham's criticism of poetry, the point here is that poetry is too playful, too inattentive to descriptive accuracy, too careless with the facts to be compatible with anything like the quest for truth. Poetry is thus the enemy of truth. 
And again, for a thinker like Bentham, there's something worryingly useless about the arts. Now, utility, one always has to remember, of course, is the central determining element in Bentham's thinking, particularly in his thinking about morality. What is moral is what is socially useful, what advances or what maximizes the general happiness. It's hard to see what the poetic arts do to eliminate social evils, for example, or help the economy to grow, or to make people useful, productive citizens. Um, it's famously the case, of course, that um, Charles Dickens had Bentham firmly in mind when um, he wrote his great novel, Hard Times. Uh, the book begins uh, with the repulsive and uh, repulsively named Mr. Gradgrind. Brilliant Dickens' names, of course, famously brilliant, but Gradgrind's one of the best names for a, for a villain. Gradgrind declaring his philosophy of education and subsequently and uh, systematically crushing the imagination out of his young students. Again, the very first paragraph from that great novel, uh, Hard Times. Now, what I want is facts. Teach these boys and girls nothing but facts. Facts alone are wanted in life. Plant nothing else and root out everything else. You can only form the minds of reasoning animals upon facts. Nothing less, nothing else will ever be of service to them. This is the principle on which I bring up my own children. This is the principle on which I bring up these children. Stick to facts, sir. Uh, the intention of Dickens uh, is in part to show how destructive of the human spirit in education and in the workplace the Benthamite doctrine of utilitarianism was. And the whole book is an attack upon Bentham, really. But this does not, in and of itself, rob Bentham's criticism of its power. If we value truth, and if we are intent upon seeking it, as presumably we should be, then surely the arts should be discouraged. The patient, empirical, scientific investigation of a phenomenon undertaken dispassionately and without floridity and distortion is surely preferable to some poetic version of that thing. Um, the central character in Ian McEwan's novel Saturday, by the way, if you like Ian McEwan, Marky Calendars, March, uh, May the 3rd, Ian McEwan's here at USD, so you should come and, should come and see that. Uh, so possibly the greatest living novelist. And in that great novel, Saturday, um, his, his central character, Perrone, expresses a comparable thought when ruminating on his preference for non-fiction over fiction. It's an important line, I think, that's put into the, the, the mind of this, this main character. He was a neurosurgeon whose, whose daughter's always trying to get him to read great novels, and he's, he hates it. He goes through them out of the sense of duty because he isn't really interested. And McEwen writes this about him. It interests him less to have the world reinvented. He wants it explained. The times are strange enough. Why make things up? This is a brilliant idea. Even just to start thinking, why make things up? I mean, there's enough to be going along with. Why, why invent stuff? I mean, this is what, what Perrone ponders in this passage of the book. Another example. Um, I'm reading a lot right now about the French Revolution, so I've tracked down good, reliable histories by good, reliable scholars. At the same time, I'm also reading Hilary Mantel's very good novel about the revolution, A, a Place of Greater Safety. I'm enjoying it, but I'm not going to allow it to become an authoritative source because it's a novel. In fact, it would probably be a wise thing to put it aside altogether. Reading it might confuse me, confuse my researches, lead me astray, lead me away from truth, that is. Now, the more I think about this, though, I find my behavior with regard to novels even more Puzzling. Here's an interesting uh, remark by Wittgenstein uh, from the, the Great Philosophical Investigations. Wittgenstein says, Don't take it as a matter of course, but as a remarkable fact that pictures and fictitious narratives give us pleasure, occupy our minds. I find this a remarkable observation. It pulls us up short, as it were makes us reflect upon habitual things that we do. 
turns the familiar strange. It is odd, really, how we as human beings spend so much time looking at art, uh, going to museums, hanging canvases and prints in our homes. I mean, not just in our homes, in our offices. One of the first things we when we founded this place was, well, we know probably need to get some art in here. It's a strange thing to think when you think about it. You look at a wall, you think something's missing. My dog never thinks that. It seems to be peculiar that we think in terms of spaces and, and art. We spend enormous amounts of time looking at art. And when we put them up, we look at them, comment on them. It's odd, likewise, that we read fiction. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, you know, row upon row of people lounging by pools in Hawaii reading novels that they bought at the airport before flying. The shelves of those airport shops stocked for that very purpose. College classes dedicated to the novel. Novelists and short story writers locking themselves away in cabins in the northeast, typing away into the small hours, dreaming of producing the next American novel that people will buy, read, have reading groups, book groups, bowls of wine, find their way into syllabi and so on. It's fascinating, really, when you think about it. All for something that, as McEwen says, is something made up. It's not a book about you know, what happened in 1917 in Moscow. Something that's just been dreamt up by someone. Interesting that we should, we should care about that. Why I should buy your book. Now, Wittgenstein's got no desire to explain this phenomenon, of course. That's not his style. He doesn't explain anything. He's simply intent upon producing what he calls reminders of the natural history of human beings. Now, other thinkers, however, have wanted to offer an explanation. One famous account, highly relevant for the interrogation of the relationship between art and truth, was offered by Freud. Now, the production of art and the enjoyment of art also is for Freud a reaction to a world that we find dissatisfying, painful, or just monotonous. Now, the idea that the world distresses us, wearies us, is fundamental to so many elements of Freud's thought. This idea underlies so much of the edifice of psychoanalysis. Uh, for example, people fall neurotically ill, Freud says, because they cannot tolerate reality, what it demands of them, the restrictions placed upon their wishes, desires, and instincts, and so on. Now, we'll return to this when we get to the case of the artist. And our longing to escape from a burdensome and painful reality underlies Freud's theory of sleep and of dreaming. This is a beautiful passage, um, great photo of Freud as well. Um, this is a lovely description of the state of sleep. Sleep is a state in which I want to know nothing of the external world, in which I've taken my interest away from it. I put myself to sleep by withdrawing from the external world and keeping its stimuli away from me. I also go to sleep when I am fatigued by it. So when I go to sleep, I say to the external world, leave me in peace. I want to go to sleep. I love that. <laughs> Our relation to the world into which we have come so unwillingly, again, another important point from Freud, you didn't choose, you've been thrown into this thing, and it's burdensome, inconvenient, perhaps, and then you scurry back into nothingness at the end of it. So our relation to the world into which we have come so unwillingly seems to involve our not being able to tolerate it uninterruptedly. Thus, from time to time, we withdraw into the pre-mundane state, into existence in the womb. At any rate, we arrange conditions for ourselves very like what, we, very like what they were then, warm, dark, free from stimuli. Some of us roll ourselves up into a tight package and so as to sleep, take up a posture much as it was in the womb. Beautiful. One of the great tragedies of Freud's falling out of fashion, fashion is what it is, is that students don't get to read such great passages as this. It's, a, it's a terrible. People don't read Freud anymore. A scandal. <laughs> In the state of sleep, once intrusions from the external world have been minimized, the mind just does what it wants to do and longs to, namely revel in its wishes, largely unfulfilled during waking life, which is, of course, the basis for the familiar Freudian theme that dreams are, um, undisgu are disguised uh, fulfillments of wishes. Now, I raise these points because of their connections to art and fiction. Just like the neurotic, 
and just like the dreamer, the creative artist works, Freud contends, in opposition to reality. Let's see how this argument proceeds. The crucial text here is Freud's short paper called Creative Writers and Daydreaming. The key to understanding the work of an artist, he contends, lies in the behavior of a child at play. This is going to be about that, that there. Say, might we not say that every child at play behaves like a creative writer in that he creates a world of his own, or rather rearranges the things of his world in a new way which pleases him? Like the playful child, the artist creates a world of fantasy which he or she, just like the child, takes very seriously and indeed cherishes. Now, if one objects that what the artist does is surely very different from that which the child does with its toys, then Freud discerns a closer connection between the work of the artist and what develops and extends from the world of play, namely the enjoyment provided by daydreaming, by the creation and entertainment of fantasies. Freud's thought here is that the work of the author derives from that author's daydreams in which desires and wishes unsatisfied by reality can, in the pages of a story, finally be fulfilled. But this means, of course, that the artist is fundamentally a frustrated type, disappointed by reality and taking refuge in the illusory life of fantasy, and hence Freud's unflattering words about the artist. An artist is once more, he says, in rudiments an introvert, not far removed from neurosis. He is oppressed by excessively powerful instinctual needs. He desires to win honor, power, wealth, fame, and the love of women, but he lacks the means for achieving these satisfactions. Consequently, like any other unsatisfied man, he turns away from reality and transfers all his interest and his libido, too, to the wishful constructions of his life of fantasy. Now, we can rightfully react against the gendered and somewhat base nature of Freud's claim here, but at the heart of it is actually an appealing insight, uh, accounting for the valued place occupied by art in the lives of people in general, artists and non-artists alike. The Freudian insight, or the Freudian contention, is that the person who takes delight in art has turned away from reality because he or she finds it too difficult, too painful. Art offers us something more pleasant than reality, more beautiful, better ordered, and at the same time returns us to the delightful life of infantile play. Exhibit A in all of this, I think, uh, might be the current and, and, to me, inexplicable popularity of Marvel movies, superheroes, and so on. It's a, a more exciting version of, of mundane reality. But for Freud, all of art is like that. Um, I think it's Anthony Storr who makes the point that um, uh, Monet's paintings are more beautiful than what he was looking at. He, you know, he paints the river, leaves out the factories. So you've got a, a, a more beautiful version of what was actually there. Now, be, because I refuse ever to speak at these events without mentioning Edmund Burke, I'm here going to close with a line that Burke wrote to a poet friend of his, Mary Shackleton. It's a lovely picture of Burke here. Yeah. Lovely man. Um, says, you great artists never draw what is before you, but improve it up to the standard of perfection in your own minds. So... Majestic as artistic creation may be, its contrast with the search for truth is marked. A work of art may certainly have enormous value. It may be beautiful or striking or disturbing or entertaining or even life-changing. But the quest for truth is about discovering how the world is. And the accuracy, precision, and exactitude involved in that quest do not seem to be central to the artist's work. So unlike scientific, historical, and philosophical investigation, artistic creation cannot really be regarded as a useful vehicle in the pursuit of truth. So these are just critical thoughts, and I'm not going to nail my... Um, well, I, I don't necessarily agree with it. But those are important critical thoughts about the antithesis of art to truth. 
Um, but with some responses to this, I'd like to invite up Professor Helena Duray. Um, and thank you also just for the opportunity to do this. And all of these sessions, the Humanities Center has been so wonderful um, in offering these panels and getting to think about this and having this intellectual community on campus, which has been so fun. Um, and it's an honor to be a part of and to be up here with um, Allison, which is really great. So um, I'm looking particularly at truth in fiction as a short story writer and as a, a novelist. Um, and I have two pictures up here. You might recognize this bad boy of fiction. I see some heads nodding out there. James Fry, a bit of a throwback to the mid-2000s. He's um, the author of a memoir called A Million Little Pieces, kind of a drug and rehab and sort of, um, you know, kind of, mm, oh, bad life kind of and how he came back from it and um, wrote the story of it. And of course, he's a bit infamous now in the literary world for writing what was classified as a memoir but had plenty of invention along with it, some details such as the span of his jail time, which he cited as 87 days, and in reality it was about five hours. Um, he you know, wrote in the story, in the, in the memoir, that he was involved in this melee with the police, and actually in the, in the police report they note that he was really quite pleasant and you know, amiable in their interaction with him. So, of course, there are all these inventions that we would call lies, and many readers felt betrayed, most notably Oprah, who had chosen his book for her book club and confronted him on stage on live TV. And at the other end of the spectrum, truth in fiction, there's um, this volume of a novel, a, a six-volume six set of novels now by Carl Uwe Knausgaard, a Norwegian writer um, who's infamous now in his own way for what's been called radical self-exposure. He's written this six-volume, many, probably thousands of pages about his innermost life, his family, his wife. Tellingly, he's now divorced, somewhere between book one and book six. And there are many interviews with him about how he's actually, he's expressed regret about so radically exposing his self. The, the exposure in the writing has fed back into his life so that it's affecting what he's now writing about being affected. So it's this, this sort of constant feedback mechanism. Um, so kind of extreme examples of, of deviation or, or deviance in the world of truth in fiction. Oh, which button is it? Oh, the one I Thank you. Great. So this kind of brings me to the question of, well, we have all these true stories. We tell true stories all the time in our lives, but we're actually telling fictions in small ways all the time. Um, and why? Why is it that we're all in some ways fiction writers in our lives? Well, first of all, fiction is generally kind of commonly thought of as invention. I've made up a story. I'm telling you about aliens on planet Zoltar. Obviously, I have invented a story and that's a fiction. But fiction has a much broader definition. Um, and in fact, its, its origins are really from um, fingere in Latin, which means to shape or to craft as if with one's hands, to rearrange, to select. So not necessarily to invent out of thin air, but as Brian said, to rearrange the pieces in that, in that quote from Freud, right? That we rearrange in our fantastical worlds just as much as we invent, that that too is a fiction. So there's also the problem of memory, which we all know is so unreliable. And of course, there's so many studies now about just how unreliable people's memory is. And those of you who have siblings, sort of the classic example is that you were both present for something in your childhood, and now as adults, when you talk about that story, you have completely radically different narratives about how it went down. Usually you're the, the hero, or you know, paint yourself in a more flattering light, and your sibling goes, no, 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 you were the one who killed the dog, right? So there's this, <laughs> and you both remember it exactly as it happened, but one of you must be wrong, perhaps. Okay, so the problem of memory, Although in memoirs, such as James Fry's memoir, where 
dialogue is presented in almost perfect detail, right? These lines as if they were being said right there in the scene. When we read memoirs, we tend to take for granted that, well, this, this writer can't possibly remember this conversation from his childhood or from five years ago, also probably being drunk in the case of James Fry or on pills or whatever. Um, how can he recreate it here and call that true, call that you know, exactly what happened? Well, he can't. But most of us as readers simply take for granted that that kind of reconstruction, that kind of fabrication is okay. We can't remember the exact conversation. We had a friend line by line a week ago, so we get it. We make some allowances for that. And of course, another reason we're all fiction writers is that there's the problem of telling a good story. You notice when you're telling a story about what happened yesterday on your way down to the west parking structure, you were attacked by a rabid raccoon, right? You're telling the story and you're telling it in you know, blow by blow detail and at a certain point, your audience's eyes start to wander, they check their phone and you think, oh, I better start making this better. I'm gonna leave some details out, I'm gonna get to the point, I'm gonna find $20, right? That sometimes makes people go, oh, wow, you found $20. Well, that's a good story. Right, so you're always doing this. And I noticed those of you who were at the Elizabeth Minich talk last night, she did this several times where she was telling this story that spanned years and years and years, but she made stitches and nips and tucks, swaths of years just got, you know, just cut with one sentence, and then she focused in detail on one little interaction with her teacher, Hannah Arendt, and but that was all a true story, and yet there was so much fiction in it. It was selected and arranged and omitted so that we wouldn't be subjected to every detail because not all the details are important. So we're all doing it because once you begin to write the true story of your life in a form that anyone would possibly want to read, <laughs> you start to make compromises with the truth. You can't help it. This is a quote from a wonderful writer named Ben Yagoda in this um, really comprehensive survey of the genre of memoir. And it's a really great look at how memoir has played a role in literature over hundreds of years, centuries, um, all the way up to the present moment. So at one point in this uh, confrontation with James Fry, um, Oprah asked a really good question, right? She said, why didn't you just call it a novel? You made stuff up, right? When you lie, you call it fiction. And so there are really good reasons why he didn't. First, um, he actually did call it a novel, as some of you might know. He called it a novel because he made stuff up, and he submitted it to agents and publishers and couldn't get it sold. Nobody bought it. It was a time in the literary marketplace, which it to some degree still is, of course, when memoirs were the hot thing. Everyone was buying and reading and writing memoirs. You almost couldn't like walk out of your house without falling over a new memoir, right? They were everywhere. And if you wanted to get published, you were probably writing a memoir. So he tried, failed, and someone suggested, well, most of it is true, right? So just call it a memoir. And he did, and he sold it for a gajillion dollars, and you know, the rest of the story goes on. We see what happened. So in some ways, we, the readers, are complicit in what happened to James Fry. We're part of the problem. We have a demand for these clear categories of the truth. If you say this happened, I want it to all have happened, or otherwise, let me know. So that's why some people felt betrayed. But we are part of that, right? We, are, we don't read novels as much. We primarily read nonfiction in this country, unless, of course, it's genre material like romance novels, which are the number one selling genre of literature. Um, here's another reason. Some memoirs, some true stories, get their power from how unbelievable the events seem versus the author's claim that they really happened. Or what um, one writer, Tim O'Brien, probably many of you have read The Things They Carry, that really wonderful autobiographical novel about the Vietnam War. He calls happening truth, that 
what happened is the happening truth, but then when you go to tell it in a story, you make compromises, or you don't even know you're making those compromises. As you retell it, it becomes a totally other category of truth. Still true, but he calls it story truth. And so some memoirs, some memoirs are fascinating because as you're reading it, you guys know this experience. You're like, I can't believe this really happened. Is this really a memoir? Or does it say a novel? I'm like, what? It really happened? All right. Wow. This is crazy. Keep reading, right? That sense of the pleasure of the excitement that this really happened. So why is it that some stories, if they really, you know, happened, um, shouldn't just be told as memoirs. Why isn't what James Fry experienced as, you know, a kind of bad boy, um, uh, fun-loving, trouble-getting-into person, um, why wasn't that enough? Why did he have to make that story better with invention? Well, there's a, a short answer and a long answer, and, and I'm going to give you the long answer, um, but I'll try to make it short-ish. And that's that some of you re may remember um, one of the infamous literary hoaxes of the mid-90s, a Holocaust memoir called Fragments. Does anyone remember Fragments? All right, it was written by someone named Benjamin Bukomirsky, um, whose real name was Bruno Grosjean, and as, uh, as Wilkomirski, he wrote this memoir about a very difficult um, childhood in Poland during World War II as a wandering boy alone trying to survive the Holocaust. And he wrote this as a memoir. It was sort of a, a sensation. And then some years later, he was exposed as actually having a totally different identity, being born in Switzerland and raised by quite wealthy Christian parents. And so at some point, he himself became the fiction, right? His identity became what was fictional. And the story was true to him, depending on different views of, of his pathology, I suppose, in, in writing that. But what one Holocaust survivor wrote about Wilkomirski's, or Grosjean's, um, uh, uh, fabrication is that a passage is shocking, perhaps because it's naive directness when read as the expression of naive suffering, but when it's revealed as a lie, as presentation of invented sufferings, a suffering, it deteriorates to kitsch. And so that was the risk that Fry was playing with, was his story wasn't really interesting for all that much other than eh, it was kind of unusual compared to most of us. But it was a little kitschy, right? There are many people have had the experience of um, drug addiction and rehab, and that's, you know, that's not uncommon. So to make his seem even less common, he had to invent. He had to transcend the kitsch factor of it. So this brings us to the question of, well, if you have a really great story, though, if your story, your real life story is better than James Fry's, more interesting, more exciting, more unbelievable, why not just write it as memoir? Why do some people choose to write autobiographical novels based on really compelling life events? Why don't they just tell it as it is and uh, as, as they believe it happened and make a ton of money in a literary marketplace that welcomes and celebrates memoirs? Well, because I write autobiographical novels and not memoir, and I'm not making a ton of money off of a memoir-friendly literary marketplace, um, I have many reasons why autobiographical novels are more exciting and more interesting um, and transcend some limits of the memoir genre. One of them is that memoir is usually an ordering of experience. It's usually representational, sticking to what happened. And it's also usually backwards looking looking at the past of this identity who's constructing a narrative about him or herself. Some usually traumatic experiences in people's lives resist that kind of easy ordering. Part of the experience is that time went wacky. That's common in combat trauma or any kind of violence usually. People have a sense of, oh, this, you know, there was almost like a time warp. Well, how do you represent a time warp in a genre that 
kind of depends on looking backwards in a really ordered and methodical way, right? How do you represent something that resists that? And then here's a third reason, that constructing a narrative, telling a story, isn't just about telling what happened to you. It's not just documentation or recording. It's also about inventing a self, inventing, inventing an identity. Um, for, for many people who've experienced some kind of trauma, that trauma usually splits their lives into a before and after. Any of you who might know a veteran who is suffering from PTSD, they often seem like, well, maybe they seem like a different person after the war than they were before the war. That's a, a, common, a common experience. And so what constructing a narrative can do is not just tell the past, it can actually retell the past in a way that helps a person unify his or her before and after. It's a story that brings these before and after selves together in one more coherent narrative that lets this person move forth and survive this experience in a more cohesive and more successful way. So um, there's a really wonderful book on this, a, a literary critic named Lee Gilmore, and she talks about novels that are limit cases, autobiographical novels that in some way are using the opportunities and the possibilities of invention to transcend what happened to this narrator slash author. So um, just two quick examples she talks about. One is Dorothy Allison's novel, Bastard Out of Carolina, which is a memoir, or not a memoir, sorry. Um, it's a, a heavily autobiographically novel um, in which a character named Bone, first name is Bone, is um, very closely aligned with the author, Dorothy Allison. She's a survivor of sexual abuse, and through this story, she kind of escapes and finally confronts the enabler, enabler of this abuser. And so what the fiction allows her to do is to have agency in this world where, in real life, she didn't, right? She gets to retell this story as she might have preferred it to happen, or a story that allows her to have some control over the events and how they're told. Mouse is another example she um, details. One in which, those of you who've read it, of course, you know that the characters of Mouse, who are um, uh, a person who survived the Holocaust and his son being raised in, in America, all are represented um, as mice. And of course, the Nazis are represented as cats. And there's the fiction is in the tension between the very human dialogue in this graphic um, novel and the, the literally non-human representation of these um, characters. That fiction allows this author to do things and move in ways in that world that he wouldn't otherwise, right? It allows these opportunities and this kind of freedom for reinvention. Um, there are many other examples. This is really, really just sort of skimming the surface of of these kind of limit cases. Finally, I want to use a little personal example of how fiction is a tool for survival for some people. Um, and this is uh, a photo of people who were, this is 1945, this is not long after the liberation of the concentration camps, and this is a photo of people who have recently been liberated. This is taken in a refugee camp not long after, sometime that year, I don't have the exact date. So this person, this in is my dad, who uh, was 21 around the time that this photo was taken. If he were still alive, he'd be 96 this month. And this photo, when I saw it in my late teens, blew my mind because the story I'd been told, the story I'd come to understand, was that my dad had actually escaped Auschwitz. This is the story he told. He broke away, he was chased into a forest, he hid in the forest, he survived, he made it out. He was the hero of this story. <clears throat> when I found out that he'd actually been liberated from the camps, I felt betrayed, right? I had seen him as this hero. And it was many years, many years later, when I understood that conflation, that, and let me add this small part, after the war, he was in a refugee camp. He went back to Poland. He was conscripted into the Russian-Polish army. He didn't last very long there because he didn't enjoy being in the army, especially after time in the concentration camps. And he escaped the army. He went AWOL, 
He hid in a forest, <laughs> made it out, came to America. And so what happens is those stories got conflated in him, probably. Another possibility is that they were conflated in me as a small child. He might have been telling the stories distinctly, but I might have needed to see him as the hero of this world, right? So it could be my conflation. But either way, there's a sense of this story allowing someone to be the hero of their own story, right? Not to be a victim of a huge, horrific historical force, but to be a person who's able to control his own fate, to escape, right? To outwit the enemy. That has always, ever since I've come to see it this way, made a lot of sense to me. If my father had written a memoir of his time in the Holocaust, would it, you know, would that be absolutely unethical to represent his escape differently than it was? Absolutely, right? He shouldn't have done, he shouldn't do that. But is it a tool for surviving something so traumatic and going forth into life and having a successful life? Absolutely. So fiction has these powerful potentials for helping people um, in pretty amazing ways. I'm going to end there. Oh, actually, I'm just going to show one more quote um, because it sort of summarizes that there are some stories that don't fit neatly into these categories. This is one of my favorite writers, a fiction writer named Karen Brennan. And in an essay, she wrote, I want to say that this is not a memoir, too messy, and not a theory, too untheoretical, and not a fiction, too true. There's some things that don't fit in those categories. So that's it. Thank you so much. Here we go. So maybe I'm an object lesson, um, now that I've heard what you guys have um, presented. Um, so I'm going to deliver a kind of artist talk. Um, without showing my own work, maybe. Um, thank you for organizing this um, series of panels um, and echoing what Helena said on a larger scale, creating a lovely forum at the Humanities Center. Um, it just seems to be getting better and better. Um, and thanks for inviting my participation on this particular series. I'm really glad to speak as much as I can to um, truth. And I just feel really lucky to have um, drawn truth rather than beauty. <laughs> um, what I think I can add to this conversation as, as a visual artist is it's been wonderful to be reminded, you know, how carefully chemists, um, Mitch, I, I saw you talk, consider the distance between the literal and the metaphoric. I, I should know this, you know, I'm on a college campus, but it was lovely to be reminded of that. And also to listen to another colleague remind us that scientists don't talk about truth much, but facts, theories, hypotheses. Um, Maliki, speaking wonderfully a few weeks ago, pointed out that Ala Sassur, um, who my understanding of whom is only trickle down 80s art school level, so uh, maybe we all had to read Roland Barth, but like, you, you know, uh, so I'm no expert, but that, you know, there is, there is no absolute truth to words, that the distance be between, you know, signs and signifiers, uh, it's endemic to language. So that was really helpful to me in sort of thinking about how to, how to address this. And of course, um, he also covered the superpowers of indirection and, and basically presented the talk that, you know, I would have wanted to give, but much better than I would have. Um, scooping me on Dickinson and Picasso. Um, here, wait a minute, it's not going forward. Am I doing this wrong? Um, on this Picasso quote, um, and also on Emily Dickinson, and um, in addition to Picasso and Dickinson, I offer, well, if I can offer it, here we go, I'm learning, um, Mike Watt, who's the bass player for the Southern Californian band, The Minutemen, who said, John Fogarty, not born on the bayou, still a good song. Um, I'm going to, um, images will start about halfway through my 20 minutes, of which I probably won't use all of. I'll leave some on the table for questions. Um, there's a bureau that will disperse, dispose of, situate, rehabilitate, redeem, repurpose, transmute, dissolve, or whatever the terms, literal, figurative, um, discern infallibly the correct way to get rid of your stuff. And your stuff from when you were a kid. And your kid's stuff. And your parents' stuff. And your parents' stuff from when they were kids. Maybe you don't have any issues with stuff, but as a sculptor, 
I, I do. I live in a household of sculptors, so we have a lot of stuff. Um, it's a bureau, not a business. They're not taking a cut of the profit from all of the crap, I mean stuff. Um, so you don't usually have to worry about anything. Um, you know, any, any, anything, there's no monetary avarice, there's no systemic self-dealing corrupting their plan for the perfect disposition of the crumbling copies of comic anthologies from the 70s that your siblings treasure but will not take into their homes. This isn't a sharing economy thing either. It's old school government as provider of service for the public good model. The energy wasted by non-professionals trying to decide how, when, or even whether they can let go of their hat collection undoubtedly lowers the GPA, costs millions in lost wages, lowers the tax base, and let's not even get started on lost innovation opportunities because someone cannot let go of their great uncle's hat collection or their former neighbor's dead husband's hat collection. <laughs> the rich can hire assistants to align all household appliances from one house to another, to another, to another, so that no hungover father, shiftless heir, or au pair, number one, two, three, or four, need struggle through the non-intuitive instructions for the toaster oven ever. Um, they can sustain a brownstone floor on the Upper East Side, full of folks shopping for hazmat suits and apocalyptic escape strategies. They've also long hired personal assistants that, you know, passed their collections off at maximum tax advantage, um, or sold their haute couture to discreet resale market. I don't know if you guys knew, but um, when the price of a barrel of oil fell to its lowest point during the mid-80s oil bust, pawn shops in Houston um, began to compete with each other by providing discreet limo service from your home to the hawk shop. You can bet that the hyper-wealthy have been making careful disposal decisions for less easily liquefiable stuff as well. Before Social Security, we sort of lived with this idea that starving folks who were too old or too sick to work was some kind of natural. Um, we fixed that, I, I guess. We got a new deal. Um, we won't have to waste the time and emotional energy disposing of all our stuff some correct way. The public provision of ethical, poetic disposal options, sentimental or not. You can check other boxes. Revenge, for instance, catharsis, maximum sorrow, or final closure for your stuff is now a trip to a federal office away. Your father's briefcase can be vaporized, shot into the stratosphere with just the right amount of explosives to make sure its shards drift forever beautifully rather than becoming space junk um, or simply living on in half-life in your garage. Your grandparents' home can be returned to the indigenous people whose land it's on, or maybe it can become an artist's colony. They're not all in the Northwest, I mean East. So this could be a way to simultaneously punish and advance your ancestral town. Those readers' digests can be pulped into new paper and used for unique broadsides that circulate an existential country ballad. Quilt you never liked? The Bureau brought it to refugees. Or maybe in an intermediary step, they diabolically shipped it to a relative with a loving but guilt-inducing note. Some things take an indirect path if you enlist the Bureau. This sounds like a dream to me, and um, I am, as I think Brian confessed himself several weeks ago, not entirely immune to confusions in the status of my consciousness. Um, but, but it was worked up as a bold policy initiative in the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. Right around the same time, this was during Nixon's administration, that a three-way negotiation between the House, Senate, and the White House nearly established universal health care. Um, you'll remember this was scuttled, at least partially, not by Watergate, but by uh, Representative Wilbur Mills's late night drunken swim in the Tidal Basin. He had had an altercation with a striptease dancer. Um, it just took a circuitous route to us. So, in fact, I've extravagantly lied to you all. Well, parts of it are true. <laughs> uh, actually, a lot of parts. Um, or I confabulated. Um, my students sometimes use the term contrived pejoratively. This drives me a little bit nuts since art is absolutely contrived rather than just well expressed. I'm not a writer and I'm inexpert at certain kinds of lying, but as an artist I have a lot of gusto for things I wish were true, 
or that are truer than day-to-day -day true, or that make one wonder what could or maybe should be true. We spend a lot of time tricking ourselves a little, tricking others a little, in order to make believe that things we didn't believe in before are true, or remind you of things you've forgotten, um, to say things you couldn't hear any other way, hopefully about some truths that aren't only true to us. Um, so now I have some examples of some artistic truth telling in my own discipline. Let's see if I can make this work. Um, I'll just leave this up here for a sec. Um, I can't be anywhere near exhaustive here, and the language that visual artists employ, especially contemporary artists, by, by the wild range of its materiality, its forms, sometimes its immateriality, which I'll come to, offers even more indirectness, and again, this could be its power rather than a deficit, than the written language that I think um, both Helena and Maliki, um, and in fact, all of us use. Um, so rather than organizing my examples into an incomplete scheme of figurative language, I've chosen examples around some kinds of truth that art might be particularly good at addressing um, by dint of its indirection or its concreteness and immediacy, um, its directness, because who said art can't be oddly direct and indirect at the same time? Um, playfulness, pretense, willingness to lie spectacularly or subtly, or its performativity. I started thinking about this after a former panel here on truth and language. Um, there's a certain kind of language that's both figurative and literal at the same time. So um, an admission as a sculptor of a particular kind, I've got a special concern for work that plays with scale and time uh, more than image. So the, the dissing on painters was all, you know. <laughs> gravy to me, um, and uses some very simple metaphoric means. Um, I'll note here that David Anton, who I was lucky enough to work with at UCSD, who's written wonderful things about narrative, I suggest the, uh, I think it's called The Pauper and the King, and it talks about the need to con construct through time a narrative for the self. Um, he also said that really bad art and really great art have more in common with each other than either has with mediocre art. And I think he was talking about a kind of structural clarity in figures of the mind. Uh, the really bad stuff might offer clarity <laughs> and a less true truth, maybe kitsch, I think, um, and the evocation of a sort of false sentiment of some kind. Uh, some of the works I'll show you is tactics straight out of the playbook of the Federal Poetic Disposal Bureau. It still lacks an acronym, I'm afraid, uh, that I invented, and sometimes on a national and a historic scale. Um, they deal with the stuff we have trouble appropriately dealing with otherwise. I don't believe this makes art a second-class kind of knowledge at all. Um, I think it's uh, undervalued. Oops, I went too far ahead. Okay, so this is um, Touch Sanitation. Uh, in 1969, Merle Latterman Ukulees was um, overwhelmed by the amount of repetitive, unacknowledged labor that was involved in caring for an infant and realizing that she was not seen as an artist anymore, but as a mother who made art, she figured that she could kind of continue to be an artist while undertaking all of this monotonous activity um, of childcare by just redefining those chores as art. So the Manifesto of Maintenance Art 1969, which is an early statement of feminist art practice, includes the line, the sour ball of every revolution, colon. After the revolution, who's going to pick up the garbage on Monday morning? Um, in 1979's Touch Sanitation, Ugly is the artist in residence of the New York Sanitation Department. So this sounds just as fictive as my bureau, but it's absolutely real, and she's been filling that role for 40 years. Um, she shook the hand of all 800-plus um, sanitation workers in New York City, thanking them for keeping the city, which was kind of dying at the time, uh, alive, quite sincerely. Um, Nick Riggle actually used Adrian Piper's work in a talk earlier uh, this semester. This is My Calling Card 1 and 2 by Adrian Piper. Um, this is number one. Using the antiquated kind of 19th century social convention of calling cards, Piper adopts this kind of, I don't know if it's passive aggressive, it's just, it's like the realistic solution to a very real problem in her life um, to showcase how racism and sexism are sort of um, affecting her, one of the two calling cards 
uses the misperception of her race. So she's a light-skinned African-American. She's also an analytic philosopher. So some of you may know her for one body of work, some for another, to confront anyone who shares a racist remark in her presence. The white card, which was made later, thwarts this sort of sense of um, availability in the world, that she's available simply because she's unaccompanied in public space. So, you know, in, in the first piece, in, in Merle Ukulis' piece, it really speaks to how we're all vitally connected, but often through systems we do not acknowledge. Um, these works, the world doesn't treat us all the same. Um, art life, 1983-84, this is the work of Teching Se with uh, Linda Montano. Um, in this performance, the two artists spent one year tied to each other with an eight-foot long rope. They inevitably stayed in the same room <laughs> and were not allowed to touch each other until the end of the one-year period. They also ran into some, I think, difficulties with elevators and department <laughs> stores in Manhattan, I've heard. Um, we're actually all alone, or, or life is a life sentence. This is actually, a, I, th I think uh, Teching Se has said, life is a life sentence. He's famous for these very austere performative works, one in which I think he clocked in every hour on the hour for a year. So he disordered his own sleep um, to do this. Um, so for him, life is a life sentence in which we're basically waiting around to die in the words of an existential country song. Uh, a very different type of work. Um, on the 20th anniversary of the Bhopal disaster, when, um, which was you know, this industrial gas leak that killed thousands um, of people in India, on the 20th anniversary, a spokesperson for the company um, appeared on the BBC World News and announced that Dow had finally accepted full responsibility. For, for this disaster and that they were creating a $12 billion plan to compensate the victims and clean up the site. Uh, I think the announcer said, you know, after they cut out what a nice thing, and uh, the spokesperson for Dow, presumably, said, I wouldn't work for Dow if I didn't believe in it. Well, it turns out he didn't work for Dow. <laughs> this was um, the hacktivist artist group, the, the Yes Men. Um, in the hour after the hoax was revealed, um, or before the hoax was real, sorry, Dow's stock temporarily lost billions of dollars. So by announcing this radical new direction for the company, the ethical one, um, to compensate the victims, clean up the plant site, and otherwise make amends, uh, you know, they, they exposed something much bigger than just that this company was now embarrassed into saying that they weren't doing any of this. Um, markets punish corporations if they try to make good on damages. Uh, so. I mean, I suppose here, you know, in a, in a sense, the truth is, and artists have always been really good at this truth, is the shitheads are running the show. Or maybe it's something systematic, which is certainly a concern of this piece, that, you know, they could go do the right thing. Um, oops, I've lost control here. How do I go to full screen? Did I do that? Oh, thank you. Somebody fixed it for me. Um, this large-scale installation is uh, by Sam Durant. It's Proposal for White and Indian Dead Monument Transpositions, Washington, D.C. Um, all of these gray objects are 100% scale mock-ups of 30 obelisks found throughout North America that mark the sites of, of massacres where either Indians or white settlers died, always in groups. Um, they were very lopsided. Most of, most of them memorialized um, settlers, though some did memorialize Indians, though they tended to be um, tribes that had um, been pacified and were perceived to be friendly. Um, basically what Durant is proposing here, and the proposal is the work. I don't think he's even sent this proposal to like DC anywhere. Um, which is, I think, interesting to me when I show this to students, that like the realization that like, I don't think he'd even bother, right? Because what he's proposing to do is to take these from you know, cornfields throughout North America and move them straight to the mall and stick them right in the middle. I mean, we have no other sort of um, monument that does what this one would do. So, I mean, I think in this case, this work, you know, the truth of this piece is that you know, we breathe lies that we're not even ready to contemplate. This is another image of it. And lastly, 
and this is a piece I grew up with and puzzled over and love, um, Time Landscape by Alan Sonfest, uh, 1978 to present. It's a living monument to the forest that once blanketed Manhattan Island, so he used a sort of palette of native trees, shrubs, wild grasses. He did a ton of research, but for me, especially in hyper-gentrified New York and in the real estate market now that this, I check every once in a while to see that this still exists, right? I mean, I'm pretty sure it'll have a needle tower with a 160-foot void <laughs> in the middle soon. Um, but it's a slowly developing forest that represents exactly what, you know, this train would have looked like uh, at the point of maybe, you know, when Dutch settlers arrived. It's 25 by 40 feet. That is ample square footage for a needle tower. Um, but I think this piece, you know, transcends the geography of the space. It's really kind of its truth is really we're finite. You know, we're either more or less powerful than we imagine. And that I will close. So thank you. A little bit of time for questions. Um, about five or ten minutes for questions. If anyone has anything they'd like to raise. Uh, in two ways. One is like, you yeah, really start with Socrates in the mirror, because human beings live in two worlds, the ex external world and the internal world. And it seems to me the arts reflect the development of the inner world as real, or I would say a kind of inner existential world, right? And if you take the mirror, you know, mirror, if you reflect on the outside, then there's a reflection in one sense, a mirroring, but if you flip it around in the inner world, then there's also a reflection because it's deep thought, it's contemplation, right? And so I'm surprised that he didn't criticize himself about that, because that to me is not an apology, art is not an apology for lying, it's, it's actually looking at a different truth. Right. So I remember when I was uh, uh, painting in, uh, in Yalo, I was doing these sort of, act sort of expressionistic, uh, impressionist paintings, and I was moving as I see things, experience things. And I remember once, you know, I, I did a stroke that reflected a kind of flickering leaf that's falling down. And I thought to myself, did that actually happen? And I did not know. <laughs> All I could have was my experience of it. I suppose I could like rig, next time I go paint, rig a camera system to photograph <laughs> me as I do it. But even that, then it would be that the contraption would be the part of the art, right? So I decided that was a kind of important moment for me because I decided since I actually couldn't objectively say that happened because I experienced it, I'm just going to go with it because it was true, right? And it seems to me, even with animals, you, you think about lions and what are all animals, they have this play period in which they're learning how to, in a sense, fight, but they're playing. They know the difference between the play and when they go out there and kill something, right? So that is actually also a kind of inner development, in a sense. The other thing I have exception with it is like the nature of language. It just seems to me you either believe the nature of language could actually get right down exactly mirroring the truth, or else there's always a gap, right? And I always find it curious that Plato always dealt with metaphors. Well, the closest thing he did was, was to divide a line, but he also had like the myth of the cave and myth of the sun. Why would he criticize it when he's using the same thing that he's criticizing against? Why don't he just draw his own books or books in diagrammatic form, like the divided line. So the fact that artists understand that language could never pin down something, in a sense, opens up the relationship between representation and nothingness, and how it's always unfolding. And it seems to me that's not an apology for lying. That's a, that's a confession about how it really is, that we are always in the process of uncovering the truth, rather than like getting exactly what it is. So the fact that we also believe in poetry as sort of being sort of more open to this relationship between 
what is and what's unfolding is a very, very important part that somehow this current culture has sort of like put a sign that is not a matter of development, it's a matter of getting the exact thing. So I, I am not going to be apologetic <laughs> about, quote, lying, which I'm just telling the truth. <laughs> So that was not a question. <laughs> I'm defending the audience. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes, I agree with you on that. I mean, it, it's, it's such a strange part of the Republic. And he is a great artist himself, so it's odd for him to be doing that. But I, I think, again, what I like about it is it does raise a question about why we, why we value things of this nature. And I, that's why I put the Wittgenstein thing up there. It's something to be reminded of why we spend our time with it. We don't just go foraging for food. We don't just take care of our, our bodily needs. There are certain things which don't have that kind of Benthamite utilitarian value, which are puzzling. And I don't mean puzzling in the sense that they're irrational and um, to be dispensed with. But we, we step back and say, why do, we, why do we do this? And I think this is why... Um, both of you, your presentations are so valuable. And this thing about the memoir and the dividing line between the memoir and the, the autobiographically informed fiction is such an interesting thing. We have time for one more question before we close. Or any, not a question, it could just be another reflection, so it just fails. Um, what's the theory of the author who wrote the book on memoir then that the Yagoda? Y A G O D A. Mm -hmm. yes. Can you tell a little, say a little bit more about what he you, is? It sort of not not a how-to book, but more on the philosophy of. Yeah, it's 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 in some ways a survey, but kind of a deep survey of um, sort of what memoir has looked like, like all the way back to Defoe, um, you know, who wrote I think his first few books he called the autobiography. Uh, they were you know fictional autobiographies of characters, and so the way we have seen autobiography and memoir take shape and change and kind of co-evolve with fiction over centuries. And he, he looks at, um, you know, he looks at like Victorian literature and the role of autobiography and memoir in that and just kind of takes kind of different topical views of, across. So it's, it's diachronic and synchronic. Yeah. Defoe's the interest, the Journal of Plague is an interesting test case here. I remember reading that and thinking, oh, this is an eyewitness account of the, of the play. Clearly, it's in that style. And then you realize it's written, he would only have been four years old when the plague happened. So it's completely reconstructed, and you get this strange sense, almost vertigo, when you realize that you're not reading something that's an, a, a real eyewitness account. So. Oh, I'm sorry. No, please, we can take both questions. Oh, oh you go first. I'm here all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we'll get both questions in, so. Well, I, it's not a, a really well-formed thought, um, but it has to do with both the observation and I mean, your comment about um, the diachronic and the, and the synchronic distinction. I'm interested in, apropos of Wittgenstein's observation that we do delight in these fictions, if one of the appeals, if it seems to you guys that one of the appeals of engagement with aesthetic materials is their relative stasis, their reliable being in relation to the flexible, permeable, constantly dissolving present. Hey, that's not part of what's enticing about them. They, they may not always even point to a legitimate truth, but they at least point to a stably present alternative on which we can depend. I don't know if you guys can speak about that at all. I'm making a note to try to find uh because I mentioned David Anton's piece on narrative, and narrative is something that I probably know the least about in this room, um, <laughs> except as a reader, but that he's um, locating some of, some of the reasoning for narrative in like, you know, your, your first lies as a kid, when, when you have to explain where you've been, linking sequences of events to sort of explain yourself. Um, but the pauper and the king is, is very much about, I forget what, the, there's a quote about like, one of them, the genre for, for one, for, for the king, is autobiography, and the genre for the pauper is science fiction. But for both of them, narrative has to link them, because if you've gone from being a pauper to a king, like you can't actually enjoy being a king. 
you're just stuck again. <laughs> so I mean, it, it, like to me, that's very much, and also because I now tell my daughter stories uh, at night, certainly feeling, because I don't normally tell stories, though I just told you one, is like, yeah, the ability to kind of, like watch yourself ma manipulating it, I could totally see that I'm probably enjoying that on a subconscious level all the time. So Schopenhauer's theory of art has that aspect of, it, of plucking the object from the stream of movement mm -hmm. and time and freezing it, as it were, <clears throat> and as part of a kind of a consoling element in art that you're taken away from the hurly-burly and the drift of life and it's taken up and it achieves that kind of permanence as much as anything can. And I would say that the idea of you know, stability of the genre or, or instability that in, for me, the way I think about it in memoir and autobiographical fiction is that the voice of a memoir is a stable voice. That is a, that is a kind of public identity for public consumption and that that voice has already established its own kind of stable identity and it's showing maybe a trajectory of how it became this stable identity. But to me, the difference in autobiographical fiction is that that identity is unstable. Its instability is the excitement of the narrative and that that instability gets manifested as the spontaneity of language to construct the events. And um, the, the quote that I think encapsulates that is the sort of father of French autofiction, autobiographical fiction. Um, Dubrovsky, who said, uh, writing autobiographical fiction is entrusting the language of adventure to the adventure of language, hmm. which is so nice, you know, yeah. A last observation. Um, so with, with regard to the discussion about memoir and autobiography and fiction, um, you were speaking about um, stories, books, or an artist is putting together this package that's then um, coming to the public. I was wondering, I think it's similar to the art with social uh, media, where everybody is sort of constructing this persona and sort of a narrative over their life, which may or may not be truly what's happening. But is this, does this fit in one of your categories? Or, and these are sort of just regular people doing this, not necessarily artists. Does this fit into some of your conceptions of certain categories? Yes. Absolutely. I mean, I think in, that is one way in which for all fiction writers, we're presenting these kind of identities um, daily in, in all kinds of ways. But also, social media is a really wonderful kind of linguistic version of that kind of presentation of a constructed self, right? And that that's one of the reasons people, you know, like get off social media because you see all your friends having all these amazing lives, and of course, you know, we realize, oh, that's. That's also a fiction, but it's just it's a fiction in which the you know the character has the same name as the author, right? And there's so many examples of of that. Yeah, I think that's a really insightful observation. Yes, it reminds me of Lacan's observation: we are all fictional characters, <laughs> which I've always found characteristically frustrating. <laughs> But please speak to us afterwards. But I would, uh, we should close things down now because I know some people have to head off. Thank you all so very much. Come and see us next week. Thank you.